You bartended and DJed at the same time. I, I did. It was some nights I was the bartender, some nights I was a DJ. So it wasn't the same on both nights. I mean, same night wasn't both both roles, but yes, maybe on Wednesdays they needed me to DJ. And <laughs> I was I was I was uh, probably a DJ more on the weekend than I was yeah. during the week and bartended uh, more on the weekday. So but now that we know you have this skill. <laughs> it's been a lot of years, Melissa. We need to leverage that in some way, shape, or form for the network. We'll we'll have Mike help us to create maybe some uh, some some uh, music as we like get on stage at our next conference, <laughs> or we'll uh, we'll see what we can do to leverage it for that. that okay. Would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like if I'm right, music. was the um the the holiday light festival? Is it the largest outdoor uh, Christmas light display in the country? It, it was at one point. I don't okay. know if it still is, but it was at one point, as I told you through email, it was, um, I mean, this is one way in time. one way out. I'm sure it was a mess. Oh, it was brutal. Trying to get into, into the park and out of the park was just a nightmare because it was a lot of big buses that, that brought people in and it was awful traffic as you probably witnessed when you, uh, when you went through oh, it. Yeah. So, it's an all day affair. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I yeah. had no idea. I had no idea. Uh, yeah, Brian Trailer also wants a shirt. Brian, I I'm so jealous of Tom's wardrobe um, and and how much he he's able to be branded. Um, it's 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 really awesome. So if if Brian gets one, can you send one to me too? That would be great. <laughs> Just make sure Brian gets a, a we call it a schmedium. <laughs> That's yeah, I, I can tell that you have to peel that shirt off of me for sure. If I even got it, yeah. <laughs> showing off the guns today. <laughs> I love it. Okay, speaking of guns, uh, so we have an interesting football weekend coming up, um, right? Ohio State, the Buckeyes have have an interesting game. How are you feeling about that, Tom? Big matchup with Notre Dame. We're we're favored to win. It's it's in uh, South Bend, so. We're going to find out between the two teams um, who's ready to be, you know, top flight in the country. I'm, I'm a little nervous about my Buckeyes, but we're going to we're going to see what they're made up tonight or Saturday night. Yeah. yeah Tom, Mike, what do you think? Yeah, I do feel a little better, Tom, after our performance last week. We, we've sort of put some stuff together that I didn't see the first two weeks. So I'm I'm uh, I'll be biting my nails probably, but uh, hoping for uh uh, I I, uh, I probably dislike Notre Dame about as much as I do that team up north. So I, right. I hope we put a, a hurting on them. Although I'll just take it. My yeah, my wife may have to watch the game in a separate room because she gets far <laughs> too anxious for these and tends to scream at the TV a lot. But we'll 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 get her through it. Yeah, we got a Ducks fan with us too. Hey Ken, um, do they play football in? Oh, bless, bless, bless. Shots fired. We also have a very interesting game this weekend. Uh, we're playing the Knolls, so I'm I'm a little I'm a little nervous. I'm not gonna lie. Um, they're coming to to Death Valley, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And Clemson is unranked for the first time in quite some time, actually. So I know, I know. Thanks. We've you know we've we've our coach is amazing. We've had an amazing, amazing run. Um, we have we have some growing to do this year and and our our team's got great kids so we'll um i'm sure i'm sure give it our all <laughs> have a feel seminoles might be right for an upset i'm just saying uh, i i could say that the same about the buckeyes so <laughs> we'll we'll see we'll see we'll see oh yeah. Matt, you you like opened up this like bear like wound. Um, Matt Velasquez is, is is saying go Duke. It's 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 a little it's a little too raw at this uh, at this point. So thanks, sorry. <laughs> the heart of September. That's how you know the rivalry start. Uh... Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, I gotta re listen to Morgan. <laughs> Are we okay to go ahead and get started? Let's do it. All right. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm Melissa Langdale, President and COO of the Mortgage Collaborative, joined today by Tom Gallucci, our very own Tom Gallucci, SVP of Business Development, and a very special guest, Mike Cool with MGIC, who happens to be the coolest person at MGIC I know. Um, sorry, I did tell him I was going to use that joke. I love a good pun. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Namesake so aside, he really is the coolest. <laughs>
So the, I, I understand Mike, obviously that you are with MGIC, but I think you need to separate just a little bit. So I want to open up a, a little bit for you to, to say what you need to say there. Yeah. Thanks, Melissa. Um, it, it just, at least for the next 30 minutes, just uh, know that any information provided by me during this, uh, during this show is for educational purposes only and, and opinions expressed by me during, during the show are, solely mine and not necessarily reflecting the views and opinions of MGIC. So uh, I'm glad to get that out of the way. Let's get get rolling. All right. That sounds awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you to MGIC for the awesome partnership with the Mortgage Collaborative. We really appreciate you guys. Uh, obviously, uh, also providing some swag for, for Tom. Um, yes. <laughs> Uh, but let's let's kind of go ahead and, and dig right in. Obviously, we've we've had um, our industry as a whole has a lot of challenges in front of us between inventory shortages, uh, affordability, um, you know, kind of also being a challenge with rates where they are in inventory being as low as it is. Prices have maintained high, you know, um, prices have maintained kind of their their kind of. Uh, level. And so, you know, between high rates and, and prices not going down, affordability is still a challenge for a lot of, a lot of people. And so we just love your insights. What, what are you seeing out there um, that may be helpful for us? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you both uh, for allowing me to be part of the call. Uh, I've been looking forward to it for some time since, uh, since we got it on the calendar. So, so thank you for that. Uh, when I think about affordability, I actually think about kind of two sides to affordability. Uh, one, Melissa, you just spoke about, right? I mean, rates are up, prices are up, and they've both gone up substantially. And that's just challenged, I think, uh, all homeowners uh, with inflation uh, to be able to afford uh, buying a home or buying a, uh, a jug of milk, right? So uh, so that in itself is, is certainly a challenge. I saw recently from Redfin that um, they said that entry-level buyers today need to make an annual salary of 64500 which is about $7,200 more than it was at this time last year. So uh, that that's a substantial jump. Uh, something else that I saw recently was that uh, since 1965, uh, home prices have increased 7.6 times uh, faster than what income has. So mm -hmm. uh, one of those two seems like they has to change. Either, either the pricing has to come down or slow down, or we need better wages, right? So um, that that is uh, driving a lot of um, discussion and uh, issue, quite frankly, in the in the American population. So, yeah. Um, the the other side of that prong, I guess, would be serving the underserved. And I, I know this is obviously a big push for for FHFA and the agencies. And uh, I really think that starts with the home ownership rates themselves. And I just kind of bring them up here. U.S. Uh, home ownership rate is sitting at about sixty six percent. Uh, for whites, it's at almost 75%, just under. Uh, Hispanic or Latino is at 48.7%, so mm -hmm. large drop. And for uh, Blacks, it's 45.2%. So um, we, we think about home ownership, and home ownership, in my opinion, is the, the greatest vehicle to wealth and building wealth uh, in society. And so then I, I bring back up the wealth gap between the, the groups and Currently, the white net worth average is $184,000. Hispanic or Latino is sitting at $38,000. And Blacks is sitting at $23,000. So just huge gaps here. And, and I think about the things that we typically try to do to address um, those gaps. And a lot of times it's creating product, right? We, we, we think there's a product to solve everything. And I would argue that's not the case. And, and I know at MGIC, uh, one of the things that we put together uh, is what we call ARCs, which is awareness, readiness, community, and solutions. And we think that these are the pillars to serving the underserved. Uh, again, it's not a product. Product's certainly part of it, but we need, we need to get to the community stakeholders. We need to find the nonprofits, the lending institutions, uh, certainly the folks that are on this call. Um, we need to have a, a ton of collaboration, and it's going to take a lot of commitment and hard work. And I think that that's probably one of the main messages I would challenge this group with is let's look at ourselves in the mirror and find ways to find solutions. The affordability piece is it is what it is for now, right? The rates are what they are. The, the uh, prices are what they are. Uh, but trying to close some of the gap on on trying to serve the underserved is is something that I think we all could hopefully take some pride in and look in the mirror and say, what am I doing? What is my institution doing to to try and close that gap? So. 
those are what I think about as it relates to affordability. Yeah, I think, you know, gosh, you hit on so many topics there, um, you know, serving the underserved just to kind of pull on the one that you, you talked about last. Um, it's such a big challenge, right? It's, it's um, ensuring that you know, as you're as you're growing your company and looking for for opportunities to better serve the the market, that you're doing it in a really intentional way, um, and uh, so you know, having outgoing education, having also a, a plethora of products, um, like you mentioned earlier, I know that can be kind of the go to solution, um, but having a a breadth of products so that you can meet the needs of everybody is is really important. Um, you know, I I know that. There are um, there are a lot of um, you know you you also mentioned something about the the, the demographics of of home ownership rates and and um, the kind of um, the the way that housing kind of builds into uh, you know that that next level of financial freedom for for each one of those individuals. Are there things that you're seeing that other lenders are doing to capture that? Um, you know, that audience more or uh, things that just, you know, in conversations that you're having with others that you've heard of that that's working? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, one of them would be um, being engaged in the community, right? Again, it's not product alone. You certainly have the products to bring to the to the to the group, but you have to be engaged in the in the, in the community. And um, if, if uh, you're not using the various um, social um, media uh, avenues to get uh, access to those groups. Uh, quite frankly, looking at your loan officer group and are you hiring uh, loan officers that look like the community that you're trying to get access to is really important. I, I think about uh, is it's um, Hispanic Heritage Month this month and I think about that community. I mean, they don't trust financial institutions. They don't have a lot of trust, but they're the largest by far growing community in our in our world as it relates to trying to to gain access to home ownership. So. I just think we have to be super engaged with um, with the communities that we serve, and uh, we have to be purposeful uh, about uh, the efforts that we make to try and gain access to those those groups. and um, And so, again, I think uh, there are product conversations that need to happen because there may be situations. Again, going back to the wealth gap, I mean, there are are, are definitely differences in what somebody uh, can qualify for in some of those groups, and we just have to be mindful of that and find ways that we can educate, uh, find ways that we can create product that's going to allow them to be successful because uh, a mortgage should be more than just a transaction, right? We're trying to set these people up for um, for home ownership uh, for life, right? We don't want them to come in and fail. We want them to be successful. So it could be that they're not ready today, but they will be ready tomorrow if we spend the time and effort in, in trying to educate them and make sure they understand what goes into it. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and Mike, you make great points to um, just being well connected into the communities that you're trying to grow market share and serve. And, you know, there's a way, you know, to recruit from an originator standpoint, but also to set your team up with those centers of influence within the community and be able to speak and market to the communities that you're trying to drive into um, in a relatable fashion. This is a bit of a plug for MGIC, but being Hispanic Heritage Month, I did notice you guys have put out some great resources just recently to help lenders from a marketing standpoint uh, to the Hispanic community too, because we've talked about that in multiple past conversations that the, you know, the Hispanic community is so diverse just within its own right. And you can be, you know, over um they're under communicating based on what segment of the community that uh you know you're looking to engage with in your metro. And I think you guys in particular do a fantastic job of really arming lenders and originators with resources to uh to help arm them to better you know educate and serve their communities. Yeah, th thanks for that, Tom. We definitely have a, 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 a ton of materials from a marketing perspective that that uh, folks can go in and and co-brand and use. Uh, in in gaining access to referral sources that are in that marketplace, um, I'm actually headed down next week to uh, the NAREP con convention. Uh, it's their annual conference. It's a it's a big conference. So if you're going to be there, look me up. I'd love to love to catch up with you. But uh, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind just sharing how large this group is. Uh, just a few stats that I, I, I kind of took down. 
Uh, currently, there are 62.6 million Hispanics living in the U.S. Um, this next one's kind of mind blowing. Latinos are expected to make up 70% of home ownership growth over the next 20 years. Wow. 70%. So I guess I would say to you, hopefully there's a little bit of a wake up call and hopefully it's just a reminder because you're already doing it. But if you're not putting a program together to gain access to this community, um, I, I would challenge you, you might want to look in that direction because that is a group that is, is continuing to grow. Um, uh, according to NARIF, uh, currently there are 7.9 million uh, Hispanics that are mortgage ready and another 2.8 million that are near ready uh, to purchase a home. Um, and just in the last decade, they formed 628,000 new households in the U.S. Wow. So it, 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 I could go on and on with the number of statistics that, that shout at the top of the mountain that we need to be paying attention to this particular segment of, of the population. And there are great opportunities to develop relationships across your communities, uh, hopefully starting with realtors, right, to, 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 uh, to, to show that you are engaged and that you are serious about uh, trying to offer services to that, that, uh, that segment of the, of the population. Well, those are really great stats um, and, and definitely eye-opening in um, the focus, you know, of, of a lot of our lenders and, and where that needs to be over the next couple of years. That's, that's fantastic. Um, I want to pull to, you know, obviously how people buy, um, particularly in times where affordability is a challenge um, and, and how our loan officers uh, that, that might be with us today are, are having to kind of uh, think outside the box and, and be really um, consultive in nature to each of our, you know, customers that they're dealing with. Um, are you seeing, you know, back in the day when I used to sell, and I think a few people on the call have, were, were, they knew me back then, um, you know, it's, it is, I, I used to see a lot of kind of single premium finance MI or kind of split premiums as we've kind of shifted the market a little bit to be, you know, in more of a competitive market as people are kind of looking for, for volume in, in each of the markets that they serve and looking for ways to better serve the communities that they're in. Are you seeing people leverage those particular products more, or are you still seeing most everybody go with kind of the monthly MI uh, opportunity? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, I would say that they are not doing singles much. I think as our, as the MI industry looks at, at, as singles, I mean, I think back um, mid 2000, say, 13, 14, 15, there was a, um, a, a lot of business done in LPMI specifically. In, in some cases, upwards of 25% of the business was in that category. And um, the agencies came out with uh, PMIRs, private mortgage insurance eligibility requirements, which required the MIs to hold more capital for a lender paid uh, single. And so we did see at that time, some shift to borrower paid singles because they are cheaper than a lender paid single. But generally speaking, we're talking single digits now as a percentage, um, especially if you think about lender paid beyond the fact that it's more expensive now than what it used to be. Uh, you're also looking at higher rates, right? So if you're, if you're gonna increase the rate to pay the premium, which in some cases that's what happens, now you're taking a high rate and already, and then adding it, adding more to it, which a lot of times the borrower is not interested in that. So I, I won't say it's not being done because there are, are uh, folks that do single premiums as a way to separate themselves, or maybe just in a consultative situation where they're, they're giving their, their folks a, a better option. Um, one thing that we have seen, this is something newer for us. I think it's the first uh, premium type change or new premium type that we've come out with in 25 years, but we have a, a, a product called Choice Monthly. And Choice Monthly, if, if anybody's familiar with splits premiums, which, which don't get much activity either, less than singles for sure. But Choice Monthly is a more flexible split option. Basically allows your borrower to take advantage of any excess money that might be out on the table from a seller or from a builder or any other third party, quite frankly, where you can, you can pay some of it in a single premium, which then reduces the amount of monthly that you have to pay, uh, of course, on a monthly basis. So um, we are seeing some activity there. Uh, although I would say certainly when we move to a buyer's market, which we haven't really been much in lately, we get into a buyer's market, I think that will have a lot more play. Yeah, I agree. You talked earlier about kind of the inventory shortage and and you know the challenges that that's presenting as a whole. Um, you know, if you think about 
hopefully at some point this will kind of shift to a little bit of a buyer's, a little bit more of a buyer's market, but, but who knows um, if, you know, if inventory remains as low as it is right now, which I think right now we're at a one and a half month supply. The last time I looked, um, which it, it, you know, a healthy market is five or six months, right? So, you know, if if we stay that low, most people think about kind of home building being the option, right? M maybe our home builders can kind of help to fill that gap. Um, are you seeing anything with with um, you know home builders that are that are helping to fill that gap, or maybe even um, ways that they're partnering with with lenders um, on on you know maybe doing some concessions and, and things like that to help uh, get get more people into homes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and interestingly enough, the number I had seen most recently was the number you quoted at 1.5. Uh, actually, NAR came out this morning and said that we're up to now 3.3 months. Okay. Supply, which still is well below the six that we should be at in a heart in a healthy market. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, there's a couple of contributing factors. Probably the biggest would be coming out of the crash, uh, the Great Recession. Uh, from 2010 to 2019, we built fewer homes than we built in any decade back to the 1940s. Yeah. And so that that put us in a major hole because we we didn't stop having home buyers, right? And mm -hmm. and so that continued to put us at a deficit. And, and quite frankly, now we've had 14 straight years below the 52 year average on single family home units completed. So we just have continued to build a little bit of a hole to, to quite frankly, we can't make up quick enough. And, and the builders are certainly building many more homes now than what they have in the past. Uh, they're in a great spot, quite frankly, uh, because they, they do have the ability to, to build homes and lumbers come back down from where it was there at that the high spots that, that stopped them from doing things. But um, I, I do think there are certainly plenty of options moving forward. The problem there is, uh, depending on the type of home that you're trying to buy, it's $100,000, I heard from, Na, uh, from the National Association of Home Builders, $100,000 just before you put the shovel in the ground. So it's hard to build an affordable house when it, you've got that kind of regulation and cost and fees that are up against you. Um, the, and the it's also thing, a, a three-year time frame, right? Between, you know, dirt to actual home, right? It, it Depending on the municipality, you've got kind of two to three years that they're having to, you know, kind of invest in that land before they can ever even kind of see a return. And so you've got timing as an issue and, and then the affordability, because they're basically building out all the infrastructure for the neighborhood as they develop it. Um, and in a lot of cases for the city or the municipality, the county, depending on where it's at uh, as well, because they've got to put in water and sewer and roads and they've got to they've got to widen roads in some cases. And so those kind of impact fees are adding to that that hundred thousand dollars that or, or are a part of that hundred thousand dollars that you just mentioned, which is yeah. a, a big challenge. Yeah. The, the other thing I guess I would throw out there and this one doesn't get as much publicity, but it's just it's a fact. And the GSEs, uh, obviously, when we came into, into the pandemic, uh, created the, the foreclosure prevention programs, right? I mean, we had forbearance, and you can argue whether there were people that took advantage of it that, that didn't need it, right? There, there's certainly documented cases of that. But they've kept going with foreclosure prevention actions. And just this year, we've had almost 106,000 home buyers that have, have been put into some sort of a foreclosure prevention action. And while that's great for that homeowner, that would have normally been pre-pandemic inventory that would have gone through foreclosure, right? And then and then there would have been new stock for people to to, to purchase. Yeah. And so that's also attributing to the shortage of inventory is, is that. So Mike, we've got a great question in the chat that I want to highlight. Um the uh, Terry Evans asked, could you do a quick overview on which are best options in today's current market with the potential of lower interest rates slash refis in the future and how MI relates in the various MI uh, payment options like LPMI, monthly split, split et cetera. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll do high level. And if, if anybody has any direct questions, they can either come to me or they can reach out to the local account manager. But um, I mean, think about monthly is, is 90 some percent of the business that's done today. It's it's just easy. It's what we've done forever and ever. It's easy to 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 explain to a borrower that it's in your payment and um, 
and when you reach a, a spot where it can be canceled, you can cancel it, right? So monthly is is what most borrowers do in today's market. Um, singles, uh, you have borrower paid singles, which are typically non-refundable. And you bring up the refi situation. I would argue today, if I'm a loan officer, I'm doing a loan thinking that I'm going to do two loans, right? I'm doing a loan today at seven plus percent. I'm probably going to refi you as soon as a, a rate becomes advantageous for you to do that. So I'm, I'm trying to, to do that. With borrower paid single, um, you are in a non-refundable situation. So if let's say, for instance, the rates dropped, uh, if you listen to MBA, they're saying that the rates are going to be down to six by the end of the year. I'm not certain I buy that. Uh, and then the fives next year, if that happened, we're going to see a big refi uh, move. And for those singles that were done, they're non-refundable. So you, you don't get that back. You can't come back and say, hey, I did that borrow paid single and it was $4,000. Do I get that back? Uh, you don't. I mean, it's non-refundable. Um, so that would be something that I guess I would throw out to, to consider and think about when you're putting your borrower into a program, especially if you choose that non-refundable option. You can go with the refundable option, but it's much more expensive than what you typically put folks into today. 99.9% .9 of uh, borrower paid singles today are non-refundable just because of the, the sheer price of it. So I would keep that in mind. The lender paid side, again, um, that's typically where you're going to raise the rate. Um, to or the lender is going to fund it in some some fashion, uh, where you raise the rate to cover the cost of that single premium, which again will be more expensive than a borrower paid single premium. Um, so again, in today's rate environment, that might be a struggle and a challenge to get people to qualify um, with a lender paid single in today's in, in today's environment. Uh, splits have been one that have really made me puzzled over the years because we've had them for a long time and. I don't think it has ever reached one percent of of any MI company's uh, production in splits. It just again, it operates really like FHA, and and it just has never caught on. So, um, so now that they referenced the um, uh, the choice monthly, that again I think is is got a, a major play. Less so today in a seller's market, but in a buyer's market, uh, there is a real play for choice monthly that I think folks need to pay attention to. So. Hope that's been responsive. Great. Yeah, Terry says thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and Mike, along that front too, just thinking of the expansion of equity that has taken place with rising home values, um, you know, probably largely due just to the lack of inventory. You're seeing higher in my cancellation rates because of that with a lot of homeowners in recent memory. Um, there certainly have been. I mean, I think I think folks have taken advantage of the ability to to uh, cancel uh, the mortgage insurance. Uh, one thing I'll say, because this is a common question, we we are not the controller of canceling MI. It's the servicer of the loan. We get that question uh, a lot. Um, so so that that obviously is driven based on the rules that um, the Homeowners Protection Act have set out there in each institution's interpretation of the Homeowners Protection Act. But we, we have seen some of that. But the volume, Tom, has been so heavy over the last four years, call it, uh, less so obviously the last year and a half. But we've been able to add uh, add to our book of business and with rates in the two, three, four percent, our book continues to build because rates now are north of seven, right? So unless you have to move, you're not. So, it, precisely. And, and yeah. it just, it limits the consumer's ability to be able to put down 20% or something sufficient in that case. And I do want to give a shout out earlier um, between your guys' stats on the inventory out there, Mark Renault makes a great point here, the three and a half. And Melissa, you kind of dug into this too. Does it take into account the 60% of homes that are under construction, therefore not for sale, so that that one and a half number and not months inventory are pretty spot on? Yeah, no, fair, uh, fair point, no, no doubt about it. One thing that does concern us in today's market, uh, I don't know how many people caught it last month, uh, we passed uh, $1 trillion of credit card debt for the first time ever. And so we, during the pandemic, we saw uh, all of us probably did. I mean, we, we couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't do anything. So our savings uh, was something that we continued to build. And unfortunately, what we have seen is um, we think in the third quarter, at uh, some point in the third quarter, early fourth quarter, all of that excess savings will have been exhausted. So we've lost all of that. And, and again, I think you see it with that that credit card debt, the highest it's ever been over a, a trillion dollars in, in debt on the credit card side. So something to keep our eyes on. 
Great point, too. And I honestly find that surprising that we don't, as a result of that, see more of an uptick in home equity volume. Just thinking pre-Great Recession, uh, how much equity volume or refinances were done to consolidate consumer debt in the past when it was at previous record highs. Yeah, I, th I think part of that, Tom, is that um, the values have been have gone up so much. And I think lenders coming out of the Great Recession are probably a little bit nervous that that's maybe not real. And if I allow you to take all your equity out of your house and then value, values go down, that that's just a problem for everybody, quite frankly. So I think there's been hesitancy in the lending community to do some of the home equity lending. It's not certainly as, as available as what it used to be uh, in the past. So if, if I also, there's a layer of kind of credit card debt and that $1 trillion is significant. Uh, so please don't, please don't get me wrong, but there is a layer of consumer behavior that also has shifted, um, Great point. you know, with credit card companies offering, you know, points and cash back and, you know, all of those sort of things that we've, we've seen people kind of naturally shift to just putting things on their credit card, but they pay more of it off. So I, I would love to see a statistic that would help us to kind of bridge to better understand that consumer behavior. Is is this trend more of something that that should lead to delinquency rates, or is it something that um, is just a, a shift in consumer behavior? But but it is a significant number nonetheless. Yeah, no fair point. Right, we're all trying to game the uh, the uh, rewards systems, right, to try yeah. and get points and things that we do. Um, I, and I think until there's a material change in unemployment. I mean, unemployment's still at a, a super low number. I mean, I think they say that a healthy market is somewhere in the four and a half to 5% unemployment, and we're in the, the mid threes. So yeah. until that changes, I think we're probably okay. But certainly inflation has pressed that a little bit, right? Because people are spending more on things that they than they did before. So it looks like Keith was, was thinking the exact same thing that I was. So thanks, Keith, <laughs> for putting that in the chat. And Guys, we are right up at time. We've had so much fun talking. Um, we we ran out of time. But before we go, I want to make sure that we ask everybody, what are you going to do this weekend? I know we got some football plans in uh, in the mix. Um, Mike, what's what's on your agenda? Yeah, we uh, my wife and I are going with two other couples down to Red River Gorge, which is in uh, kind of south, more east, but southeast of uh, Lexington, Kentucky, and. Uh, renting a cabin and just kind of doing the wilderness thing for a couple of days. So we're super excited about that. Oh my gosh. I'm jealous. That sounds amazing. That would be a fun getaway. Uh, oh. Before I give my weekend plans, I do got to give a shout out to MGIC to the original uh, mortgage insurance provider with half of actually more than half of our lender members. I researched this in advance of the call, uh, having relationships with MGIC, which is more than any MI provider out there. So if you're not partnering with MGIC, plenty of TMC fellow members to uh, leverage for your experience. So for me, outside of Buckeyes, uh, I'm going to exit my golf sabbatical of nearly two months and get at least nine in tomorrow after uh, coaching flag football for my, my son in the morning. And then uh, we'll see what happens with the Browns on Sunday. That sounds like a really fun. Weekend. What about you, Melissa? Yeah, Melissa, how about you? Uh, I have a little bit of golf in, uh, we're gonna, um, we're going to play nine holes uh, Saturday after uh, the Tigers play. So we we have a really late tee off. Uh, and then I have um, uh, some some just family time on Sunday, nothing, nothing huge. We're going to go out to eat at a, a nice restaurant downtown Austin. So um, that's it. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mike. Um, really appreciate you and MGIC um, and all that you do for our, our network. Uh, thank you for, for sharing all of your amazing expertise and insights with us today. It was really, really valuable. And I hope everybody has a fantastic weekend. I will not see you next week, but Tom will be here uh, and we'll be uh, leading, leading our, our helm next week. And we hope to see you guys all then. Have a great weekend, yeah. everyone. Thank you all. Great weekend, everyone.